CBS. It's CBS News on the Hour, sponsored by O'Reilly Auto Parts. I'm Monica Rick. It is a day of mourning across Russia. <laughs> you to this service of worship, whether you are here in the sanctuary today or joining us on radio or on YouTube. Palm Sunday is one of the most beautiful uh, Sundays in the Christian year when we celebrate Christ's entry into the city of Jerusalem and the events that followed during Holy Week. I would call your attention to uh, the announcements that are printed in your bulletin. When you entered this morning, you got a small booklet of announcements. Uh, amongst them is an envelope. Today is the Sunday when we are receiving the One Great Hour Sharing Offering. 
Uh, the One Great Hour Sharing offering goes to a number of things, but amongst them is it is used, some, a, a good deal of it is used for disaster relief. I have a brother-in-law and sister-in-law who live in North Carolina, New Bern to be exact, and uh, they said that when uh, the last hurricane came through there, that Presbyterian Disaster Assistance was one of the first groups there to help out, and it was one of the last groups to leave. So it is money well spent. We encourage you to uh, share in, in giving to that offering. Also, uh, I would remind you that uh, this Thursday night here at the church, we will have a Holy Thursday service. The choir has been working for some time on a cantata. There will be a live chamber orchestra. We'll have the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, uh, and we will celebrate Holy Thursday uh, and the events that led up to Christ's crucifixion. We encourage you, I encourage you strongly to be a part of that service this Thursday night at 7 o'clock p.m. There are other announcements in the bulletin. Uh, there's an Easter egg hunt coming up. That's in there. There's a coffee hour following the service. If uh, you would like to have some more of the cakes and things that are uh, still out there. And uh, I think that's about it. Let us worship God together. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Will you stand and join me in the call to worship? Let us worship God. Have you heard of the stone speaking? Yes. yes. Jesus said that if his disciples remain silent about him, the stones themselves would shout. We do not want to be guilty of silence. Let us rejoice with those who acknowledge Christ as King. Praise God. Praise Jesus, the triumphant Son of God. Jesus, our Savior, 
Like the people of old Jerusalem, we are stirred by your presence. In your gentle Savior, we see God on earth. Walk in our midst this hour to awaken our hearts and to nourish our souls. Increase our lives that strength and faith that was so visible in your life many years ago. Amen. Please pause in silence as we think through what we had just read aloud. Amen. invite the children to come forward and to bring your palms with you if you have any palms. Do you have any palms? Didn't get any palms yet. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good? Come on. How are you today? What's your name? Cadden. I'm sorry? Cadden. Cadden. Okay. Would you like to have a seat with the other children? So, boys and girls, today we celebrate what? Palm Sunday, right? Do any of you know what Palm Sunday is? No? no? Everybody like threw their coats down on the road. And Absolutely. A palm. And they got palm branches and took them off of the trees and they waved them. Okay. Everybody has palm branches, right? Have any of you been? Have any of you been watching? Uh, you probably haven't been. Did any of you ever watch the Steeler games? No. <laughs> Some do. You guys don't watch the Steeler games. Uh, do any of you watch any? Any basketball games that are on TV right now? Well, at the Steeler games, those crazy people that go to Steeler games, they have these, these uh, yellow towels. They're called, uh, what are they called? Terrible. terrible towels, that's it, they're terrible. They have these terrible towels and they wave them up in the air in celebration of a touchdown or in celebration of something special that had happened. So that's kind of what Palm Sunday is all about. Jesus was riding into town, and a lot of the people thought that he was going to become an earthly king. And so they grabbed these palm branches, and they waved them in the air, and they took their coats off, and they threw them on the ground, because that's what you did when a king came into town. You, you know, you, you gave them your best. And uh, so then they came, that's how Jesus came into town. And so that's what we're celebrating today, this exciting time when Jesus came into town. And that's why we have the poems, okay? So let's stand up for one second, okay? Do you guys have poems? Did you get poems on the way in? Yes. Okay, you stand up too. Okay, ready? We're not gonna stay, say, yay, Steelers. We're gonna say, thank you, Jesus, okay? One, two, three, and wave your palms. Thank you, Jesus! <laughs> okay, so that's what Palm Sunday's all about. It's a great day. And you guys can go back to your seat, and we're going to celebrate the sacrament of infant baptism now.
Thank you for being here. Come on. Hmm? Yeah. It's a matter of whether Ada is ready or not. <laughs> she looks good. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. In, uh, in our church, as I explained to you when we met a couple of weeks ago, in our church we believe that there are two sacraments. One of them is the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, which is communion, or the Eucharist, and the other is baptism. So today we proceed with the sacrament of infant baptism. Something's going on with my mic, and should I turn it off, turn it down? What should I do, Bill? Move a little bit? Okay. All right. Sit. Jeff, turn that one off. Okay. All right. We'll just have to put up with a little buzz. Here are the words of our Lord Jesus. Jesus said, All authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. Obeying the words of our Lord Jesus and sure of his presence with us, we baptize those whom he has called to be his own. In Jesus Christ, God has promised to forgive our sins and has joined us together into the family of faith, which is his church. He has delivered us from darkness and transferred us to his kingdom. In Jesus Christ, God has promised to be our father and to welcome us as brothers and sisters in Christ. Know that the promises of God are for you. In baptism, God has put his sign on you to show that you belong to him and given you his Holy Spirit as a guarantee that sharing Christ's reconciling work, you will also share his victory, that dying with Christ to sin, you will be raised to new life. Christopher and Bailey, in presenting your child for baptism, you do the following things. You announce your own personal faith in Jesus Christ, and you show that you want your child, Ada, to study him, to know him, and to love him as his chosen disciple. Please answer the following questions. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your own Lord and Savior? I do. I do. Do you intend your child to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? I do. I do. Friends who are in the congregation, our Lord Jesus ordered us to teach those who are baptized do you, the people of this church, promise to tell this child the good news of the gospel, to help her know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship to strengthen her ties with the household of God? If so, answer, we do. Okay. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you for your faithfulness promised in this sacrament and for the hope we have in your Son, Jesus. As we baptize with water, baptize us with Holy Spirit so that what we say may be your word and what we do may be your work. By your power, may we be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose. O God, who called us from death to life, 
we give ourselves to you. And with the church through all ages, we thank you for, say, for your saving love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hang on to the book for a second and keep the place. Hello, Ada. How are you? It's been a while since I held a little girl. What is your child's name? Ada, Catherine, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This child is now received into Christ's church. See how gracious God is that we are called children of God. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you are the giver of life. You've called us by name. And you pledge to each one of us your faithful love. Lord, we pray for this, your child, Ada. Watch over her. Guide her as she grows physically mentally and spiritually. Guide her as she grows in her faith. Give her understanding and a quick concern for others. And Lord, help her to become a true disciple of Jesus Christ, who was your son and servant, and who is our risen Lord. God of grace, Father of us all, we pray for Christopher and for Bailey. Help them to know you. Help them to love with your love. Help them to teach Ada all about you. To tell the story of Jesus to her so that your word may be heard and she might become a true disciple of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bill.
Send your spirit among us, O God. Prepare our minds to hear your word. Move our hearts to accept what we hear. Purify our wills to obey you in joy. The New Testament reading, the first reading, is from Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to 26. Once when Jesus was praying alone, with only the disciples near him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, that one of the ancient prophets has arisen. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, The Messiah of God. He sternly ordered them and commanded them not to tell anyone, saying, The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Then he said to them all, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words and of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second lesson is from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the 26th chapter. The, uh, this passage is the story of Jesus spending time praying in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples, Palm Sunday had occurred. The disciples and Jesus had gone to the upper room they had um, shared together uh, in the Passover feast. And this is where that passage begins. Then Jesus and his disciples went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And going a little farther, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to the disciples, and he found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and he prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, again he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. And so he left them. And he went away once more, and he prayed a third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to the disciples, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayers. Amen. Oh, I've never been 
much of a rebel. But obedience has never been one of my favorite qualities. In fact, I still remember and I still in my head can hear my mother's voice today saying, Johnny, it's time to eat. She'd call to the vacant lot that was two doors out from where we lived and where we used to play ball. I never quite understood why mothers always called that supper was ready. You always had to go just when the ball was on the 10 yard line and you were ready to score or just when the bases were loaded and you were coming up to bat. I would try to ignore her but inevitably she would call again. Johnny, I said it's time to eat. The growing irritation in my mother's voice was obvious, but I was having so much fun, and in fact I was having too much fun to be obedient to her call. Then I would see her walking up the street toward that vacant lot where we were playing. And then I would obey her. <laughs> I've never been overly fond of obedience as a lifestyle. Whether it was my mother calling me to supper or my father telling me to stop teasing my sister. My mother and father are gone now and I've grown to be a semi-mature adult at least most of the time. And so the need to be obedient to my earthly parents isn't an issue anymore. But I still deal with the issue of obedience to my Heavenly Father on almost a daily basis. Like mom and dad decades, decades ago, my Heavenly Father commands and covets my obedience every day. And like my mother and father decades ago, what my Heavenly Father asks of me is usually, no, always, what my Heavenly Father asks of me is always for my own good. But unfortunately for me, I'm no more fond of obedience now than I was eight or 10, at age eight or 10 or younger. And it doesn't matter whether it is my earthly father or my heavenly father, I'm still not fond of obedience. Is obedience a problem with any of you? Or is it just me? Do you understand at all how difficult it is, how difficult it was for Jesus to carry the cross of obedience? Let me give you a couple of examples from my own life. My Heavenly Father told me, indeed my Heavenly Father commands me, to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. He said I have six days to get everything done that I need to get done, all my work and everything else, but the seventh day is to be a day for him and for me. I told you before I have a real problem with obedience to him on this one. Remembering the Sabbath is not the problem. Keeping the Sabbath is the problem. You know there's just too much to be done 
to be able to spend a whole day sitting around, even if it is with God, and even if it would be good for me. There are weeds to pull in the summer, there's snow to shovel in the winter, there are cars to be washed, there's groceries to be shopped for, there are bills to be paid, there are loads of laundry to be washed and dried and folded and put away, and just when I'm ready to sit down for some quality time with God, this Sabbath with my Lord, a light bulb goes out and needs changed, the toilet backs up, or a pesky neighbor stops by to borrow a wrench and then hangs around for an hour or two. I know this commandment was one of the original Big Ten that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. But that was then, and this is now, and, and for now, obedience to that one doesn't look likely real soon. The second example is neighbors. Neighbors. The Lord Jesus told me, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And, and I try to be obedient to that commandment, but frankly, some of my neighbors are jerks. I would say that one of my neighbors loves trees. Oh, how he loves trees. But you know, if he loved them so much, you'd think he'd take care of them. Half of his trees stand half dead in his yard, not 30 feet from our bedroom. I I'm just waiting for the wind to put one of them through our roof someday. On top of that yard, he, his, on top of that, his yard is so littered with logs and limbs and branches that it looks like a primeval forest. Do you see why I have trouble loving that guy? But Jesus commanded it. Jesus didn't make it as a suggestion. And I tend to disobey it. And that's a problem. I'm not alone in this problem, you know. It's pretty much a part of the universal human experience. A struggle. A struggle that began back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and the apple. Maybe some of you, a few of you, may struggle with obedience to God as well. As we saw in the scripture lesson this morning, obedience was a struggle for Jesus on the night of his betrayal. The Bible says that after Jesus had celebrated the Jewish feast of the Passover with his disciples, they went out to a nearby olive grove called Gethsemane to pray. Jesus said to his disciples, you stay here and pray. I need to be alone with my heavenly father. And so I'm going over there to pray so that I can be alone with him. And so Jesus went off by himself. And the Bible says he fell on his face and prayed. She said, my father, if possible, let this coming suffering be taken from me. But Lord, not what I want. It's what you want for me that's important. Jesus was looking to his heavenly father for a way out. He did this not just once, he did this three times. My father, if possible, let this coming suffering be taken from me. 
But Father, what's important is not what I want, but what you want. After the third time, he looked up and he saw the crowd coming towards him, carrying swords and clubs and with Judas in the lead, and they arrested him. Jesus chose the path of obedience rather than the easier path of denial and rationalization and disobedience. And the immediate result of his obedience was that he got crucified for it. Jesus chose the path of obedience to the desires of his heavenly Father, and in so doing, he set for us an example of how we are to live our lives today, even though we may sometimes get crucified for a bay. It was not easy for Jesus to make that disciple, and often it is not easy for us to take the path of obedience today. But as Christians, we know what is right, right? We know what's right and what's wrong. And we also know that choosing the right path, the path, path of obedience, sometimes gets us crucified. We know that honesty is right, but often we choose the path of dishonesty, or probably more often in, in this church full of Christians, it's the path of half-truths. We know that kindness is right, but often we, we choose the course of self-absorbed meanness. We know that sex is intended for the marriage relationship but many ignore God's intended design. We know that God intends gentleness and meekness in our lives, but our culture say only the strong survive. We know that forgiveness is commanded of us, but often we choose to hold on to our anger and to nurse our grudges. We know that gossip is always wrong, but we often retell rumors and spread half-truths as if they were the gospel truth. We know that it is right to control our anger, but often we choose to let our anger control us. We know that we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, but many choose to use their neighbor and self-indulge themselves. And we know that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our mind. but we often choose to love God with our leftovers, our leftover time, our leftover money, our leftover talents, when it's convenient. Of all the things I've ever read about obedience, I appreciate most the words of Henry Blackaby in his book, Experiencing God. Listen carefully. Blackaby writes, obedience is an outward expression of our love for God. If we have an obedience problem, we have a love problem. Think about that a second. Obedience is an outward expression of our love for God. If we have an obedience problem, 
It's really a love problem. In the 11th century, King Henry III of Bavaria grew tired of being a king and the pressures that came with being a monarch. He made application to a local monastery where the head of the monastery's name was Prior Richard. He went to the monastery and he asked Prior Richard, Prior Richard, I want to spend the rest of my life in the monastery. Your Majesty, said Prior Richard, Do you understand that the pledge here is a pledge of a life of obedience? That'll be hard for you because you've always been a king. I understand, said King Henry. The rest of my life I will be obedience to you as Christ leads you. Then I will tell you what to do, said Prior Richard. Go back to your throne and serve faithfully in the place that God has put you. When Henry died, a statement was written. The king learned to rule by being obedient. When we tire of the rules and the commands and the responsibilities and the qualities that are expected of us as disciples of Jesus Christ, it is helpful to remember that all of the commandments, all of the rules, all of the qualities that are expected of us from Jesus Christ are for our own good, are for the goods of our family, are for the good of our neighbors, and are good for the world in which we live. On this day, on this Palm Sunday, as we begin the Holy Week of the year, let us recommit our lives to obedience to Christ. For obedience to Jesus is the outward expression of our love for him. Amen. So I've asked Jim Velosich to lead us in prayer today. Before we get to prayer, um, I just wanted to share a special praise. Um, For a few months now, we have been praying for Bridget Boyd. Um, We've been praying um, every prayer time for her. And I won't tell her whole story, but long story short, um, a few months back, she found she had an abscess. It was was a tooth, and it was not healing correctly. Well, anyway, out of nowhere, uh, they did some uh, tests, and they found out that she had leukemia. Um, So we've been praying for her, and after months of intense chemotherapy, uh, she just completed her last round of chemotherapy yesterday, I was told, and she was told that she is now in remission, and she is actually with us here this morning, so I just wanted to praise God for that. She's sitting in the corner near my wife, and um, she just wanted me, she was a little nervous to come up here, so she just wanted me um, on her behalf to say, say thank you. For everybody that prayed for her. also just for everybody coming together and um, if you brought food um, at really she really appreciated it because through this whole battle um, you would think somebody who's going through something like that would be scared for themselves or whatever but that really wasn't um, what she was concerned about what she was concerned about was that her kids 
were taken care of. While mom was in the hospital, she was so worried that her kids uh, would not be taken care of. So anyway, good job, uh, Trinity, uh, the deacons, everybody that, that just gathered together. I, I mentioned this at a, a, um, a session meeting. Um, and I was just saying good job, Trinity, for when there's a problem and how, how do we react as Christians? How do we address a problem or something that's going on um, in somebody's life that's at the church? And anyway, uh, she just wants to say thank you. Thank you for the prayers. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the, the, the cards. Thank you for the phone calls. Um, it's just a huge blessing. And I, before we went into prayer, I just wanted to share that because can I just get an amen that God is good? Amen. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you today with praises and prayers. Um, we want to start off praying for Harry and Dorothy. Please help them, God, as they're going through this journey. Um, it's, there's some struggle. There's a lot of unknown. But Jesus, we just pray that you would please light their path in the midst of darkness. And we kind of uh, pray the same for Randy. Uh, we've been praying for Randy for a while and in, in his battle with uh, pancreatic cancer. And we, and we just pray that God, that Randy would find his strength in you, God. And he, and he looks to you for strength. But we just pray that, God, you'd please help him on those days where it's a little, little bit more difficult. For Dory, and praying for healing for her cancer as well, God. Be with, be with Dory as she's, uh, as, she has, as she's treated for the cancer that she's battling. Here at Trinity, God, we want to pray for, for Ada and the family and be with them while they're on this journey, God. It's so exciting and it's so beautiful, God, to welcome someone else into uh, your family. And help us, God, as a church to do our part when it comes to walking beside Ada and her family and, and just being a true family. Not just in name, but in our actions. And we pray for the Kindred Souls uh, ministry that, um, and as well as the Lowe's and Fish ministry here at the church uh, through Interfaith that reaches the needs of those in our community. And we pray for Leah and her surgery recovery. God, please be with her. And we just pray that she would have a 100% full recovery. And we pray for, uh, for Betty Walls, for Mimi. Um, please be with her, God, as, as she's in this season of her life. She has dementia and always seems like one thing after, or one thing after another, God. And we just pray that you would help her. Please help Mark and Joy when it comes to um, providing needs for her as well. Just be with her, God. Help her not to be scared. Help her not to be afraid. Just help, help her to be happy, to be comfortable. And God, we just, I, I end this prayer just remembering how great you are and thanking you um, for healing Bridget. And we pray that God, um, that we remember that you answer prayer. To remember that you're always in our corner, God, and you will never leave us nor forsake us. And God, we, we are never promised the healing. Or, for, or a miracle like this on this side of heaven. We know that there's an ultimate healing that takes place when we cross over into eternity with you. But we thank you, God, that you were gracious enough to bless Bridget with a healing while here on earth. Thank you so much, Jesus. And we pray all this praying the way that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This concludes the broadcast of this morning's worship from Trinity United Let us respond to God's goodness by coming to him with our gifts and with our offerings.
Lord God, with thankful hearts, we dedicate these offerings to you. But not just these offerings, we dedicate our lives as well. Our words, our deeds, our actions, our attitudes. Lord, help us to live in such a way that others might see our good works and glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. to speak on their behalf. Thank you for being my advocate and allow me to dwell in your presence. In the just and righteous name of Christ, I pray this. Amen. Let us go into the world in peace, and may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.